this Mother's Day, treat mom to a cookout she'll long remember. Well, will you be able to confirm that? Because it's rather important. Today we have a high of 82 with some showers later this afternoon. The 30, 30 from Manchester due to arrive at We live in a super complex world in which the population grows at a horrifying 100,000 people every day. Across the globe, hundreds of nations speaking hundreds of languages do their best to mix together peacefully. But it's not always easy to maintain a united, harmonious society. When people gather together, they need rules to guide their behavior, to elect and control their governments, and to ensure their group's survival. These rules are the subject matter of politics. In the last program, we discussed the way in which the mighty micro will transform the world's economic system by greatly reducing the working week and vastly increasing the standard of living. But economics and politics are inextricably linked and if one part of the social system changes, then so must the other. In the early 19th century, the Luddites set out to destroy the machines which they thought would put them out of work. It was just the first manifestation of a general suspicion of technological innovation and change, a trend which continues to grow. Silicon chips are just part of the development of science, and we've been living with it all our lives. It's a thing of the future. I mean, most people, it had been known that work could be made easier in big factories and things like that, warehouses where we have these machines in progress, where we might have 10 or 15 people working, you might now need two. Well, I can see that eventually it'll probably take over. You know, people will end up not having to work at all, because it'll all be done by microchips. I can't see them having much effect for a, for a long time because people are so frightened of them, really. I mean, the shorter working week from uh, computers and technology taking over. It's the coming out. <laughs> Good thing if it's uh, long as they um, <coughs> see what uh, four day week come in, same, same amount of money. Well, the first impression I've got, uh, we've got to get into it to compete with other European worldwide nations. I'm optimistic because I think we have always, throughout history, looked forward, things have developed, things have changed, and I think it's a great pity if one says, oh, this is dreadful, because I can imagine throughout history people have been worried. They're ingenious, they're novel, I don't see any problem, what's the problem? Opinions are changing, and any extreme Luddite reactions are unlikely to make any permanent headway. Any trading society like Britain, which tries to ignore the microprocessor, will soon find itself on the verge of bankruptcy. No political party in this country, in Europe, Japan or America is likely to pin its colours for long to the anti-computer lobby. The first really radical change in politics is likely to come in the way they're administered. The democratic system is at best slow and cumbersome, at its worst, more or less totally out of touch with the way the electorate thinks. If we're to win on a national scale, and to win well, we'll have to win in Leicester. All right, you're putting rather less pressure on the constable behind you. In the southeast, the current predictions offer a It can take literally years before a decision made by voters is actually implemented. In the Midlands... May as well get one vote in today anyway, no more. Now look, I, my hands, my tiny hand is frozen. Can I, can I drop it in yet? Otherwise I think you won't want me to vote for myself. All right, you've got them all now. It's going in, it's the last one, I promise you that. There has, as expected, been heavy polling throughout the day. But the ballot box could very easily be replaced in the 1980s with a dramatically more rapid and more sensitive barometer of opinion. 
direct elections with instant results by our own TV set. The issue in question could be relayed on a special TV channel and be put to the vote on the spot. Okay. Sector TM3, that's our constituency. Viewers will merely signal, via a simple keyboard, how they feel about the issue, and the computer That's at the broadcasting okay, centre will produce a result within seconds. Well, Mannering's ours. Vote now. OK, let's see. Mannering's A. This kind of instant That's feedback is already being experimented with in America and Japan. Coming up in a sec. But at present, it's only being used for simple opinion polls and credit card buying. Oh, Craig. Craig's in the lead. Election by TV could, in the not too distant future, do away with the traditional and antiquated political machine. Oh, oh, oh dear. No. Told you. Oh, well, never mind. Maybe next time. This instant monitoring of public opinion will be one of the main spin-offs of the microprocessor revolution. Like it or not, we're moving into a world where information is going to be easier to gather, cheaper to store, and simpler to move around. This will lead to a far more open society where standards of personal privacy will change dramatically. The seeds to all this are being sown at this moment in Cape Canaveral, Florida, by the Space Shuttle. This strange blend of aircraft and rocket ship is due to start launching satellites literally by the dozen in the early 1980s. Now, unlike existing rockets, it's reusable, delivering its huge payload into orbit, gliding back to Earth for a refit, and then firing off to space in a week or so. The effect of all this is going to be a really great reduction in the cost of launching satellites and a significant increase in the world's network of electronic communications. People like to talk to each other, and in capitalist societies, huge communications industries have grown up. This tends to favor the kind of society we live in, where, on the whole, information is counted as being free, communication is good, and people are allowed to chat to each other about, more or less, whatever they want. Break one four, break one four. In America, the world's most open society, citizens' band radio is already cheap and easy to use. The Bell telephone system has already approved a cordless phone which allows calls to be made more or less anywhere. Okay, thank you very much. You want to hold those calls? I'll be in in 15 minutes, okay? The coinless phone, the trend towards the cashless society, for credit card users only. 424024. Hello? Oh, hi, Nance. It's Chris. I'm Fantastic new communications devices, such as two-way wrist radio phones, could be on the market in the next few years and will accelerate the trend towards a more open society on a global scale. I'll see you in about an hour. Okay, bye-bye. In one exciting area, Britain has taken a world lead. 
the post office's press tell system, already an operational service, connects you to a giant computer via your telephone line. Over a hundred thousand pages of information, with more to come, can be called up on a specially adapted television set. You can also order goods direct from a supplier simply by quoting a credit card number. And less expensively, it brings you laughs, ethnic jokes amongst them. Even your daily horoscope, a little device connected to the TV set, will give you a print of anything you call up. It's not difficult to see how substantial changes are going to take place in Western political systems as the result of all this. But these changes are nothing in comparison with those that are going to occur in communist countries. In 1917, a popular revolution overthrew a cruel feudal autocracy in Russia and introduced a radically different notion of politics, communism. Half a century later, it had spread across the world, particularly in those parts that had missed out on the Industrial Revolution. But communism, as it's practiced now at any rate, stands in grave danger of missing out on the computer revolution. The reason is that the microprocessor is a device which begs to be mass-produced. And yet, mass production on a really large scale is absolutely dependent upon Western capitalistic methods of distribution. Creating a market for relatively trivial items which people don't need. But which they want. And which can be sold at incredibly low prices as a result. The microchips now come off the production lines by the hundred thousand, all to be incorporated in devices, some essential, others pure gimmicks, which are now flooding the more affluent consumer markets. This musical calculator is the sort of thing that's virtually unobtainable in Russia, and which has now replaced jeans as the most popular smuggled item. Of course, you might say, well, who cares about calculators and all the other computer-based gimmicks? Communist societies will probably be better off without them, but they won't. Computers are already a vital part of any nation's economy, and Russia, a decade or so behind the West in its computer technology, is already getting worried about its dependence upon Western computer imports. The British firm, ICL, for example, has had to be called in to run the timing and the scoring for the 1980 Moscow Olympics, as there wasn't a Russian computer up to the job. But there's more to it than this. As we explained in a previous program, the shift to a computerized society is going to lead to a startling rise in affluence. But it's a rise in affluence that isn't going to be shared by computer backward nations. By the mid-1980s, if the present trend continues, the growing difference in affluence between communist and capitalist systems, caused almost entirely by the rise of the microprocessor, will be obvious to all. Shuttle-launched communication satellites will mean the arrival of global television, crossing all national frontiers, relaying all kinds of information. And this general easing of communications barriers will mean that in a tightly controlled society where the flow of information is severely restricted, a major political reappraisal will become inevitable. Yours for only $2.49. Wondering what to give Mother for Mother's Day? Developed by a dermatologist to gently remove dirt and worn out skin cells. Runny nose, endless sneezing. <laughs>
Many sociologists believe that it was because black people watched TV commercials of capitalist trivia and became aware of their underprivileged state that the huge civil rights movements of the 1960s got underway. Save $102. This woman has been wearing an unusual pair of pantyhose. With satellite relayed global television, any part of the world will be watching Western TV. It may well be a massive culture shock, but will the Soviet system be able to withstand the undercurrent of longing for the goodies that the West can provide? Hi, I'm Connie Chung. And I'm Steve Edwards. It's sleek and modern. On these Channel 7 editorial. Perhaps the Chinese rapprochement with America is a tacit admission of the infinite superiority of Western technology and of the deep-seated power of the mighty micro. That this huge gulf of affluence may widen is not going to be welcome to the most entrenched communist leaders. Indeed, it may be looked upon as sufficient of a threat to provoke the worst kind of counter-reaction. Perhaps the most dangerous flashpoint of the 1980s may not be the troubles in the Middle East, the Caribbean or South Africa, but the simple fact of the coming of the microprocessor. How ironic, if it turns out to be so, that the final liberation from mindless work, from exploitation and from poverty may come not through the long-awaited revolution of the proletariat, but through the triumph of a tiny, on the one hand trivial, and on the other hand omnipotent, piece of capitalist technology. It's hard to see doctrinaire Marxists welcoming these developments. It's also hard to see autocratic societies, whether of the right or the left, being pleased at the increasing ease with which people will be able to communicate with each other in the 1980s. The possibility of a determined effort to sabotage the microprocessor revolution, or even to launch a diversionary war, can't be ruled out. Curiously, and perhaps significantly, the computer might find itself with a brand new role here, that of preserver of the peace. So, my right cavalry will evade for back through yeah, the, get them up through the general service. The Turks, knowing them as I do, I think they probably evade in this situation. My Arab cavalry will charge the heavy cavalry over there. I have to get a really good throw to make them stand against the superior numbers. And they'll... The Tartars... And against the Stradions. Yep. So there's nothing to stand up against the two pipe blocks if we can get them in close enough, because they're very slow in moving. For centuries, military tacticians have used the principle of war gaming to practice battle strategies, trying to predict the outcome of possible future combats and wars. They have the advantage of allowing one to experiment without risk of failure, and of practicing various responses to an enemy's aggressive or defensive moves. Participants in the games have often noted that the outcomes of the simulated battles were often a surprise to both sides. A reminder that human beings can't handle the enormous complexities of military tactics in their heads and of the dangerous fallibility of the hunches of even the most experienced generals. heights of realism in the Second World War, but they've entered a new dimension of realism with the arrival of the computer. Enormously complex scenarios can be fed into today's biggest systems, and the outcomes of literally thousands of different battle strategies can be predicted with a precision and accuracy which no military experts could hope to match.
Furthermore, the computer delivers its judgments without emotion or bias, considering only the cold facts of the matter. No computer would ever have sanctioned the slaughter of the battlefields of the First World War, where millions of lives were wasted on the super-confident hunches of the generals. If they had had computer simulation at the time, the message that would have come back before the battles of the Somme, of Passchendaele, of Verdun, would have been, don't try it. But alas, we didn't have computers then, and the fanaticism of the military mind had its way. Today, they play a crucial role in the strategic planning of the major powers, and while their methods and their predictions are, of course, shrouded in secrecy, it is known that they were used extensively in Vietnam and may even have persuaded the United States to pull out of what was becoming a hopeless conflict. In fact, there are rumors that the Pentagon advisors paid so much attention to the computer simulation that unscrupulous generals attempted to doctor computer programs in order to get them to support their own battle plans. Since the First World War, a new and sinister factor has crept into the picture. Nuclear weapons, if employed, will make both sides losers, and no properly programmed military computer would ever be likely to sanction their use for just that reason. No matter how adamant the pleas of the general staff, how clever the arguments of the military commanders, the computer's cold logic will always prevail. So the decisions of computers may already have saved our troubled, ever more complicated world. No doubt we should be grateful to them for that, particularly if this ensures that the human race survives into the 21st century. After all, there have been moments when all our futures have never seemed to add up to much. If this is so, then we've already begun to surrender decisions about our lives, about the control of our world even, to computers. And we're going to surrender even more in the years to come. In our next program, The Introverted Society, we're going to look at the reaction of the average human being to the spread of the mighty micro, and at the considerable social consequences of the computer revolution.